Got a little surprise there. Hey, what's up, everybody? <laughs> I can see all my, all my fellow show members laughing backstage. That's hilarious. How is everyone today? Welcome to It's All Good All right here on Rebellious Urology, uh, where every week Jim and I get together to discuss, well, whatever's on our minds, and we might even throw a few guests in here with us, which we have tonight. Uh, you can find us our show on YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch, and now on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Anchor, FM, and Spotify. And if you guys like the show, please go ahead and join the Rebellion by subscribing. Don't forget to ring the bell so you'll get all the, all the notifications. You can also hit that like button and share the love, share the show, so everyone can join in with us as well. How are you, Jim? Welcome back. I'm doing good. I my my voice is a little bit scratchy because I've driven through the California Central Valley and everything is blo in bloom. Mm. Um, and I had no voice yesterday. I had no voice on uh, Saturday either. So yeah. um, I, I took a, a lot of. Uh, There's Big Willie. Yeah. Yeah. And it was it was it was a great trip. Uh, you know, you know, you know, the whole group of us, you know, met in Vegas. That was that was a lot of fun. Uh, then from there, I went to Beale Air Force Base, uh, north of Sacramento, and I gave a talk on the history and development of that thing behind me, the Blackbird, which I thought was kind of weird since that was the home of the Blackbird for 25 years. Mm -hmm. But the Blackbird hasn't flown in out of Beale in, in uh, 32 years, so. That's where I'm at. And I'm 35 years ago, I, I put a, a goal to myself that on my 77th, <clears throat> excuse me, on my 77th birthday, I would reach the same weight as when I joined the Air Force on my 17th birthday. Mm. So on my 17th birthday, I weighed 207 pounds. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm at 209 pounds right now. It's amazing. Down, down from a huge obese size of 375. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. We yeah, well, Jim. My, yeah, the fraud that I was married to was trying to kill me through my mouth. She put food in front of me, I'd just eat it. <laughs> I swear I ate uh, 5,000 calories after dinner every night. She just, oh my gosh, wow. And, and, and it turns out she really was trying to kill me. <laughs> but oh. <laughs> I, I, I pissed her off and I didn't die. And then just just before the world, my world ended with her, I went on a uh, uh, a diet and lost 115 pounds in five months. Never gained any of it back. And I was at 260 for a long, long time. Yeah. And then um, about two years ago, well, at the beginning of COVID, I said, you know, this is... This is going to make it easy. I can't go anywhere, do anything. I'm going to go on a diet. And I'm almost there. I'm, you know, I have two pounds to go. Yeah. And I'm, 
and I will have reached my goal. So That's I'm, amazing. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have some other bodies. Yeah. yeah. We have some other bodies here, don't we? We do. Yeah. We've got yeah. some of the guys from Paranormal Chops Chat. Sonny, how are there you? There he is. And he's, a, and he's a great host, Sonny is. And uh, I spent two days with him uh, after the Las Vegas event. And that was fun. That's and it's a good thing I didn't come back through, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Stay with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're glad you're on with us, Sonny. Uh, and Spooky, welcome to the show. Yay. Hey, so happy everybody. To you guys. Hi, hey. Lynn. Hi, Jim. Hi, Sonny. Hi, everybody in the chat. Oh, man. Hey, you know, every, every, everybody has everybody has a, a UFO garage thing, either a hat or a shirt. And those, <laughs> those, those rats, Ben and Joe, oh, we promise, we promise. So Ben and Joe, if you're listening, <clears throat> you have my card, you have my address. I wear, I wear 2X. Actually, right now, I probably wear, wear just an extra large. So nice. <laughs> hey, yes. Yes. You, got, so you got to strike while the iron's hot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Ben and Joe yeah. holding out on you, are they? Oh, they no, they just they just keep forgetting. They're 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 like everybody I've everybody I've met in this group. I absolutely adore virtually wow. everybody, and they're, they're you guys are all so kind. You're you're friendly, informative, and it's just plain enjoyable. And I'm well, delighted. So to, I'm delighted to to share what I've done. Or what I haven't done with Lynn and and the rest of your audience and stuff. Well, you've been very generous with us at the Chop Shop, man. I mean, we uh, one time we had a <laughs> a guest cancel on us, and on a whim, Chad sent out an email real fast, or a, a some, uh, yeah, I think it was an email. And I swear, Jim was with us in a matter of minutes, and it was unbelievable. We just I, I think I think it was ninety seconds. <laughs> right? <laughs> it was wild. I mean, we were just so so grateful. I mean. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, thank you, man. Any, any time. Oh, thank that's you. amazing. Yeah, so, Chad said he sent him a message, and I said, if you did, he'll be here. And Chad goes, you think? Yeah. I go, oh, yeah. And then, <laughs> then, like, a minute. <laughs> he's, like, he's like Clark Kent turning into Superman. I'll be right there. Uh, that's yeah. true. <laughs> kind of, sort of. It's yeah. amazing. I love it. Yeah. I love it yeah. so much. Well, I'm so excited to have you guys on. I haven't actually had you guys on one of my shows before, so I'm ready to find out all the good stuff. I mean, you may already know some of this, Jim, but like, I'm ready to find out about you guys. I can't wait. Can't wait. Things that I don't know yet. So now I kind of know how Jim got into all of this, but how did you two like get into this field? How how did this even start for you? Was it something you were always interested in, or like what made you say, you know what? You know what I want to do? Let's do a YouTube channel about like <laughs> UFOs and paranormal stuff. Well, go Sonny. <laughs> ben, <laughs> ben contacted me one day and he was like, man, do you think you could make a channel? And basically I was going to start it up and show someone how to do it. Mm. And so I got the guy on, I figured it out, I created it youtube page and figured it all out and got the guy on there and we were supposed to go for 15 minutes it was just a 15 minute show and he was gonna learn how to do this part of it we were gonna learn this and it went for like four and a half hours oh <laughs> <laughs> and ben came on i think big willie was there it was a bunch of people that came on and at the end ben was telling me this is gonna be something like you guys aren't gonna be able to quit now you know we're and then Ben designed the channel. He designed he designed our logos and stuff. And yeah, that's how we got started was UFO Garage. And that's then we amazing. met. I met Spooky in chat and I met Chad in chat at UFO Garage. And then that's how I met uh, Dave at SOR it was from mm -hmm. UFO Garage. So for UFO Garage started it all for me. Well, I mean, it, it, it almost started off for me, too. I was at the only MUFON function in 2020. It was in San Francisco. And, and I referred to them as the Wayne's World of the UFO community. They were, they were in the lobby. They were drinking their wine. And they, there was something about them I just liked. And they, this, they, were just, they were just starting. So I went over and shot the bowl with them. And then I, told, then I said, hey, yeah, where are you from? He said, Taylor, Texas. 
I said, Tyler? He said, no, Taylor. Okay, where's that? You know, it's about 30 miles from, uh, from Austin. I said, well, I'm going on a road trip this summer. I'll come by. And I did. I went, I went and spent the, you know, spent the, the, the night with uh, at uh, Ben's and his uh, beautiful wife and cute little girl, her daughter. And they like to keep the they like to keep the place at sixty eight degrees. I live in the desert. We keep our house at seventy eight. Froze my butt off, but we I had an absolutely wonderful time with them. It was just it was just a gas, and I'm I'm just so happy that that they have grown like they have, and because of them, you know I I linked you know I I linked up with uh, with with Sunny, and then. Uh, and then I think then I found the you know, the golden voice of uh, Dave Scott, and the rest is history. And it's just been it's just been a kick in the butt. It's been fun. I have thoroughly enjoyed meeting all you guys and ladies. And there's some really characters in this group. Whew. So <laughs> that's a nice way to say it. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Definitely. So did Sunny and Spooky, have you guys had experiences of your own? Like what got you into just like UFOs or did you just kind of stumble upon it? You muted Spooky. Spooky, you're still muted. That is my biggest, that's my worst thing I do. I mean, I am always <laughs> muted. <laughs> um, Lynn, I, when I was seven years old, I had um, almost died. I uh, had a complication from a surgery that I had had um, for my throat. And, uh, you know, um, I uh, hemorrhaged massive amounts of blood. They had me in the ambulance headed towards the hospital. And my dad was a uh, Marine Corps vet. He was looking down at me, holding me, and um, was holding my tongue. And as the blood was, you know, coming out, and uh, when I looked up at my dad in the ambulance, it wasn't only my dad that I saw. I saw um, what looked to me, you know, seven years old. I'd gone to church that they had made me go to, and I, you know, I thought I was seeing an angel. Yeah. And uh, then, as I was in the hospital, uh, getting uh, better. Uh, that's when I had uh, experiences with uh, light beings. Um, as I, uh, a little bit later on in that year, this year I was seven years old, and this happened back in um, northeast uh, Tennessee, right on the border of Tennessee, Virginia. There were lots of woods and forests out there and very rural where uh, I was actually staying with my grandma at the time. And I had uh, gone out to... Um, there was a, a creek out there and me, me and my buddy at the time we would always go out there and uh hunt for uh crawdads and mm -hmm. uh crabs in the creek and uh this particular time that i'm talking about right now my buddy wasn't able to go out there with me and instead of going home back to my grandma's i said well something drove me to go back out there to the creek by myself and uh that was the time that um, I had my experience with uh, what I later learned to be my uh, spirit guides, mm -hmm. and yeah, they, um, you know, they were the the three uh, spirit guides that came to me in those uh, in the woods. Did look like the traditional small grays. Um, mm -hmm. Only one that I felt that communicated with me uh, telepathically and uh basically giving me the message that i had help and that i would always be okay wow. and um then throughout my life you know i had many many other experiences i later on um had a lot of uh help from uh mentors that uh, mm -hmm. taught me the ways of uh, buddhism and i learned how to um how to uh, practice uh, meditation and so for many years of my life that's uh what i've been doing and uh having um uh you know communications i guess or mm -hmm. you know some people say downloads and mm -hmm. you know a lot of information that i've learned through my meditations and that's basically what i try to encourage people to do now um 
is to try to uh, look inside themselves for the answers that they're looking for, rather than, you know, trying to ask the government or trying to ask other people on UFO Twitter. Yeah. Absolutely. That's kind of my, my story in a, in a two minute spiel there. <laughs> That's amazing. What an amazing story though. That's incredible. Wow. Thank you. I, um, I, at one time when I saw your, uh, support group that you were mm -hmm. having on Facebook, I was, uh, very, very close to, um, to uh, joining that. And, mm -hmm. um, I've, I've had a lot of, uh, in and outs of the community of, you know, there was a time maybe a year or so ago that I thought now is, now is the time everybody's opening up their minds and they're more accepting and they're not going to be, you know, as critical and as, uh, judgmental and but there's always it seems like every other week or so it just pulls me back and says no you're not going to tell anymore you know you're not you're done with that part of your life trying to prove to people you know yep. that you're not crazy or so i think i've pretty much just told you more than i've told anybody on youtube so oh, far <laughs> oh, i have that effect yeah. on people <laughs> Thank it's you. I don't know. I, I've you know I've always thought that if I talked a little bit more, it would be with you, Lynn. Oh, that's so nice. Well, anytime, spooky, anytime. Um, mm -hmm. But that's amazing, and I think that's a fantastic story. And you know, you and I have something in common. One of the first beings that I ever saw was the light being as well. And I thought at the same time because I wasn't involved in this community, and I was like, I thought, is that an angel? What is this? Uh, yep. So yeah, we have that in common. Yours was a little more traumatic. I'll give you that. It was definitely a little more dramatic experience than mine mm -hmm. um but and i'm sure frightening but my goodness that's incredible i really do love hearing one of my favorite things is hearing other people talk about their uh, near-death experiences because it I, I i really believe there's there's something about that experience that yeah. opens up people's minds and you know pineal gland maybe or just something that opens their consciousness and um because i've heard so many similar stories like that Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have too. It's incredible. It seems like people, when they've gone through an experience like that, that it, yeah, like you said, it opens them up almost, it, you know, you said, you know, might stimulate the pineal gland or what have you, but, uh, you know, we witches will say it thin the veil a little bit. Uh, right. Same thing, different language. But mm. um yeah, it's it's definitely a fascinating correspondence I've noticed as well that sometimes there's something about that um, and Jim, you've, you've had that as well. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed anything afterwards, but there's something about that. It seems to open people up. No, there's, there's a, uh, my mom, my mom and my grandmother, uh, hundred percent Sicilian, mm. uh, Nana could, uh, remote view. My grandfather was a fisherman mm. and this is, this is, this is 1902, 1904 timeframe. This is a long time ago. No radio, no TV, no internet. Yeah, nothing. And he fished the waters of Alaska and he was up there and they'd be gone for five months. No one knew when they were, you know, when they were coming back. No one knew how much uh, everybody made. And uh, my grandmother, uh, she was the matriarch of the clan. And my, she woke up one morning or one middle of one night screaming and all five of her kids, my mom included, come running in and says, what's wrong? What's wrong? And says, Papa just fell into the water. Now, if you fall into the water in Alaska and you're fishing, first of all, the water, the only, keep, the only thing keeping it from freezing, one, it's salt water, and two, it's moving too fast because they have 40 to 50 foot tides. So if you fall overboard, your little, you know, two cylinder diesel is not going to go catch you, especially, uh, uh, you know, if, you've, if, you've, if they've been anchored or, or the, the nets are out. And she, she wrote down on the calendar the exact time and the location she thought it was. And three and a half months later, when my grandfather came home, he, he told Angelina, you almost lost me. She says, yes, I know. He said, what do you mean you know? He said, it happened on this date. You were in this place. And also all the, all the uh, wives of the fishermen would come to my grandmother's is after they knew that they were heading home to ask, ask how many how much money is in Franco's or Salvatore's or Giuseppe's pay envelope? And it was always different. Hmm. And Nana said that, okay, when I go to sleep tonight, I'm going to visit my great aunt. And she'd been dead for a long time. I'll ask her the questions and she'll, uh, she'll tell me. 
And she was almost always spot on on the dollar amount. Uh, on my mom's side, <clears throat> she could read people. She knew everything about them the moment she met them. I don't care what it was. I can bring a friend over. And my mom, all she said was, nice to meet you, Mrs. Goodall. And my mom would give them a hug, and off they'd go. And she'd, she'd tell me all about them. All, I mean, literally stuff that only I knew, some of the, some of the stupid things we did as, you know, eight years old or nine-year-olds. But she also could predict earthquakes. She said, you know, it feels oh, like earthquake cool. weather. And within within 24 hours, we'd have an earthquake. I had I, and and I had for seven years, I had a dream. I had a vision, someone coming in and, and telling me that you're gonna be in San Francisco for a major earthquake. And I told my I told my first wife that off and on for seven years. And she said, We're just having a stupid nightmare. Well, I was down in the corner of Geary and Stockton for the Lama Prieta earthquake. I mean, I described it seven years earlier. It would be a full moon and it would be warm. It's never warm in San Francisco. This day it was 82 degrees, I think it was. And uh, I was there for it. I also had another, predict another uh, visit, if you want to call it that. But it was so outrageous, I couldn't share it because it scared the hell out of me. And that was two wide-body jet airliners crashing into the World Trade Center. I had that off and on for 10 years. Mm. And um, so that's, that's the type of, you know, uh, I, know, I know the feeling when you, when, you have a, when you have a visitation or you have a vision. It, when it, it scares the hell out of you when you think about it. Uh, two, you know, can it, be, can it be used for good, for good purposes? And that's just, uh, I find it fascinating. And then, plus, I, plus I have friends like John Lair, the late John Lair, and Bob Lazar, and a bunch of other crazies out there. So, um, I mean, I'm in great company in this group and this, this, this whole, you know, this whole community. And I love you all. Oh, and well, there's you. only there's only one person I don't have much respect for. Yeah, you know, Sonny knows who it is. I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> It's not sunny, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we're not one of those shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all positive here. Right, right. I don't know. Y'all didn't see me go off on a rant this morning. Well, Sunny did. <laughs> I did. Oh yeah. What happened? Oh, a little feisty this morning. <laughs> you go, girl. Hey. Yeah, I was sticking up gotta, for a friend. Yeah, I mean, I was just checking out something else earlier before this show, and I'm just thinking. How in the world do people want to spend an hour or two listening to this? Just so much anger, so much hate, so much negativity. And I'm like, there's got to be something else we can do more constructive and positive with this time, you know? I mean, we are the community. That's the way I feel about this. You know, uh, Ben and Joe, Sonny, Chad, Jim, uh, Alien Girl, I mean, Toddy Waba. I mean, I can go down the list. Big Willie, we all are a family and community. And these are the people that we love each other. You know, we, we identify with each other, with each other and we've, we are creating a family here. And that's why, you know, it meant a lot it meant a whole lot to Sonny and I, Lynn, for you to have us on today because Aww. we want to, we're so happy that you're part of our family too. It's, it's sort of like the Adams family. You know? It is definitely <laughs> yeah. like the Adams. <laughs> that's being generous. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why we're so much fun, right? Right, okay. right. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Sonny? We haven't heard. Have you had an experience that you're that you want to share? Don't feel that you have to if you don't yeah. want to. No, I I don't mind. I I shared it with Ben and Joe the first time, and then I even talked to Jim about this. Okay, when my my cousin Papa Willie that's here in the shop sometimes with me, he mm -hmm. tells me he's seen something that he thought was a meteor. He was on his way back mm -hmm. from somewhere with with. Uh, it's his niece, so my little cousin, and mm -hmm. somebody else was driving. So he's laid back in the car and he's watching the sky. And he thought he seen a meteor come into the atmosphere, but he said it broke into two pieces. <laughs> they were stopped in traffic, I guess, because he said traffic was stopped or slowed down. Anyways, this thing breaks into two pieces and there's a body of water where he's at. And mm -hmm. just before these two pieces, 
you know, they look like meteors because they're, he says, like it's on fire as it comes into the atmosphere and they break up. It's two triangles. And mm. one of them is falling out of the sky and it's falling down to the water where and Billy's seeing all this. The other one is circling, the one that's tumbling out of the sky, the other one's circling it like this, going down with wow. it. And he said, just before they hit the water, the one tumbling just came to a complete stop before it hit the surface and the other one did too and then the one that was falling shot up really fast out of sight and then the other one followed within a second and he said they're gone that fast straight up like straight up and gone so that's what he's seen he tells me about that never really thought too much about it and mm -hmm. then i seen something on tv that looked like what he was talking about and it was the what is it a tr B or TR the TR three B. There you go. That yeah. <laughs> okay. So I I take a picture of it on TV and I ask him, "Is this what you've seen?" He says, "Yeah, that's it." You know, and I tell him it's on TV. So that's when we found out what that was. Mm -hmm. Maybe a year after that, I was coming home. It was long enough after that that I didn't think about it so much anymore. I was coming home to our neighborhood. And as I turned into our neighborhood, I thought I seen a drone over our house because I seen four lights like shaped in a diamond. OK, and they're sitting like that. So it looked like a drone flying sideways to me, except the lights were the wrong color. A drone usually has green and red lights. So you can tell which way you're going. And this thing was all just white lights. As I turned into the neighborhood and I get to my house and I'm pulling in the yard. Now I'm looking up at this thing and I can see the cone of this big v uh, uh to me it was a stealth bomber okay so yeah. i know that's what i'm looking at so i get out of the truck it shuts those lights off and then it has no other lights on it and it's flying over the top of the house really slow so slow that mm -hmm. i'm telling you the tip is like right on top of my property when i see it i get out and look at it for a minute i go in the house to get somebody my daughter was the only one there um so she's in the shower i tell her put some clothes on and come and look. She put a towel on and I already went out front. She came out front and now it's just over the top of the house. So it's just centered with us. You can see the bottom of this thing. Perfect. It's so low to the house. Like I tell people, if there's a telephone pole up there, it would have knocked it over. And my house is a one story house. It's really, really low. And the, the neighborhood I'm in is like four blocks. It's a country neighborhood, mm -hmm. but it's four blocks wide. And it's flying down the center of the neighborhood. And I remember thinking at one point it was going so slow because it was crashing and it <laughs> didn't make any sound. And I thought it was just going to like fall out of the sky right on top of our neighborhood, on top of my house. That's what it looked like. And then it continued to go. And she went back in, got back in the shower. Me and the neighbor guy that was out watched it. It, it continued through the neighborhood really slow. And when it took off, it didn't take off like people say you know they're just out of sight mm -hmm. this thing banked and accelerated never no sound no flames and then i told that story to jim yeah <laughs> jim said if that would have been that low to my house it would have blew the windows out that they make that much noise and wow. this thing makes no sound whatever it was made no sound um mm. so that's that's the only one of the only flying things that I've ever seen that I couldn't explain. I, I thought I knew what it was. I, I thought that was a, a stealth bomber, mm -hmm. but that I, I thought stealth meant that they didn't make any noise. <laughs> 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 that wasn't the case. Wow. So, but it looked like a stealth bomber from your perspective. Oh, oh like yeah. that's what it had the oh, appearance yeah, no, of. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just a big old flying V. Black yeah. V with no lights, no flashing marker huh. lights. It was no lights on it. No lights and whatsoever. I, I could, it's so low that I could see the bottom belly of the craft. Mm -hmm. And I can see, I, I can't tell if it's riveted or what, but I can see the panels, like each panel where it <laughs> looks like it's riveted together. It looks very man made to me, whatever I was looking mm -hmm. at, but no flames. I could see the exhaust dumps in that craft, mm -hmm. and there's no flames coming out of it. It's not even when they accelerated to, to leave. And when it accelerated, it it left pretty quick. It's just not huh. a flash. You know, it wasn't gone yeah. in a flash. It, But it covered some ground when it banked and took off. Wow. Jim, what do you yeah. think of that? Any thoughts on what that might have been? 
<laughs> UFO. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an obvious answer. <laughs> Not a UAP. No, no it, it, it's if it, it, there. There's a lot. There's a lot of the the uh, shapes up there. You know, they have uh, formation lights on them, a red and green light. That that typically means it's man-made. Uh, that's the only reason to have those lights on, so you know whether it's coming or going, just like the sunny said. And I know, I know too many <clears throat> professional uh, flying, you know, military pilots who have sworn that they've chased them. My boss, retired two-star general, he chased one over Lake Superior in 1955, 56 time frame. Every time his his Wizzo, his Western, weapons systems operator, would hit the uh, uh, weapons radar, the radar would die. They pull the circuit breaker, recycle it, turn it back on, try to catch up with it again, turn the radar on. Uh, as soon as, they, as, soon as the, the weapons were, radar was engaged, it died. And it's, it's heading towards, <clears throat> they're middle of the middle of Lake Superior. And you don't fly over Lake Superior. And even, I think even today they recommend you fly around it because it makes its own weather. And if you hit the water, even in the middle of the summer, the water is like 39 to 42 degrees hypothermia, you're gone, you know, with, within a couple of minutes. But uh, General, I asked General Gatlin, I, I may have mentioned this before, but I asked General Gatlin, okay, uh, this is 1980s, mid-1980s time frame. I said, okay, I'm a, assume I'm a pilot. I'm not, I'm an NCO, but assume I'm a pilot. And I just flew my F-4 and I chased a UFO. What do I do when I get home? Get back to the base," he said. "Yeah, going to, going to ops. Do your do your post flight uh, debrief. Go to the club. Get a couple really stiff drinks. Down them as hard fast as you can. Go back to your billet and forget what happened. Wow. <laughs> because <laughs> if if you mention it, your career is shot. Mm. Now that's fortunately that has changed today. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've already, you know, I think I've already mentioned the uh, the Blackbird pilot that chased one, mm -hmm. and uh, and the thing is really wild about it. After he retired, and and by the way, the UFO left the SR seventy one in the dust, you know, in the dust. Crazy. But uh, right after he retired, because of his real high clearance, he got a job as facility manager at Area fifty one. So. He waited about a year before he started asking questions because you don't ask questions in that type of environment. All of a sudden you mm -hmm. become suspect. Why are you asking those questions? You have absolutely no business in mm -hmm. that, you know, talking about anything that you don't, you aren't directly, re you know, uh, charged to be part of. And if, if he told me that he, he knew everybody to begin with and they all said, no, Whatever, whatever you chased, it wasn't built or tested here, and didn't have lights. It was, it was reflective. It wasn't necessarily metallic, but it had a shiny surface. Hmm. And uh, Jimmy, you always say you saw a light, not a UFO, or else. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but I think you meant like a pilot reporting they saw something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's probably. That's, I'm, I apologize then. Uh, he said, you, that was something you didn't do. You did not report. You keep it to yourself and you try to block your memory. Like I didn't, I know I saw something, but I, I must've been dreaming type of uh, response. So they're there, they're here. Uh, <laughs> when NBC, was it NBC? No, Fox News, when Tucker Carlson announced here what, two years ago, two and a half years ago, that, uh, the government had made the announcement. A government spokesperson said that there are craft flying in our airspace above our cities and military installations that are not of this earth. And I was I was with Doc Skinner, and uh, he was he was talking to the Cousin Brothers. And they were trying to track down some guy who lived in Arizona named Jim Goodall. He wasn't sure how to get hold of him. <laughs> Doc said, "Well, he's about three feet from me." What? He said, <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm here. I said, hey, could you do me a favor? Do you know how to get hold of Lazar? And I said, yes, I do. I said, would, would you call him and ask him what he thought? I said, sure. So 
hung up, got on the phone, called Bob. His, I, I always call his wife. I don't call Bob's direct number. I call his, his wife's direct number. And he said, hey, uh, is Bob around? Jam said, when are you coming to visit us? He said, hopefully this summer. And he says, uh, I'll put in just a second. Bob's in the lab. I'll go get him. So Bob came on and I said, hey, what do you, what do you think of the, uh, the, net, the announcement today? And he said, when I first heard it, I got really excited. But then I said, they always pull this crap. And I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. And the other shoe has never dropped, at least not yet. So, and speaking about Lazar, I was supposed to be at his place to, this weekend. Mm. And because there was a chance of snow between where I was at and where he was, where he lives. And I drive a very fast, very powerful Corvette. I think Sonny has experienced some of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I had a, I had a, I had a cancel and it just broke my heart because I've been wanting to, to go up and visit him since he, since he moved from Northern Michigan uh, for the last couple three or four years. And so later on this year, I am going to, I am going to make a trek to, to, spend a couple of days with Bob and maybe even do a live broadcast. If I can, if I can talk him into it, I think it would be, yes. that would be a gift in the butt. Yeah. Mm. So. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting question. Sightings on 18 wheels wants to know if any of us have heard of abductees building ships for aliens. Hmm. I have not. No, I haven't. No, heard. I haven't. I haven't heard anything along those lines. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's not happening. <clears throat> I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's so many things that have, have come and gone in the black community, and I'm, I'm not talking racially black. I'm talking about <laughs> spooky. <laughs> Which one's that? Is that yours, Sonny? Not mine this time. Yeah. Yeah, that was oh, Rocky. After so Rocky. Rocky. Rocky doesn't like anybody. <laughs> he loves me. Aww. <laughs> oh, that was Jim. I've never seen that dog like anyone. Like he likes him. <laughs> Yes, one dog to another, huh? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't leave him alone. He jumps up Never in his leave. lap. I can't keep that dog away from him. That's hilarious. <laughs> dog dogs know when you love dogs. Mm -hmm. yeah. that is uh, Papa Willie is nice meeting you too. So yes. not nice either. <laughs> yeah. Yes, spooky <laughs> team Lazar. Right on. I'm I'm wearing a okay. Bob Lazar t-shirt right now, actually. That question, that question that that someone had asked you about people building mm, spaceships. Yeah. For, uh, I didn't yes, want to say I saw nothing. I saw this, that this look is, on your face. I was going to ask you. Okay, guys, I I was messing around with uh, the out of body experience stuff. I couldn't mm -hmm. sleep, so I was looking just for things on YouTube. Like they said that there was beats they could play binary beats or whatever binary mm -hmm. whatever they are that mm -hmm. make you go to sleep so i looked into that and then i came across these out of body experience ones so i figured hey what's the difference it's almost the same music it's, it makes me go to sleep so i did that well then a couple of times it worked and i felt like i had an out of body experience and then one night <laughs> i wasn't i wasn't even using those and it wasn't I, I don't call it a dream but i i just ended up on in in somewhere this big huge building and there's people above me there's two people i'm on a platform to begin with i'm standing on a platform with a rail in front of me and out in front of me is this big huge huge building i could see people working on things far away but it's so far away in this building i, I remember telling this to ben and joe that if i was to yell at them and say like hey how's it going no one would hear me you know they, they would not be able to hear me to yell back because they're that far away that's that's how far they seemed away to me so they have me building this battery and the battery shaped like a fabergé egg frame so it's flat on the bottom and it goes it's egg shaped to the top and i'm putting these cells in this frame and each time i click a cell in these cells were like this weird color blue and inside that blue moved the color blue was moving so when i would click each one of these cells onto this panel 
the cells that I had already put on there, that color blue moves through all of them at the same time. The more you put on, the more it, it, it just flows through them. And it, it so as I'm clicking these on, I start asking, you know, I, I'm picking these panels up off of a table with wheels on it that's right next to me on this platform. And that frame, that frame is just leaning against the rail the the right or the rail that keeps you from falling off it's just leaning against that rail and that's where i'm putting this together at and there's two guys above me up here and as i pick this one up and i i say you know what is this for the guy says it goes right there you just put you know so many on it goes right next to it and i said no i click it on and then i have my hand on it and i go i know what this is for what's the whole thing for and I noticed when I turned around to look at him that I can see one guy that he's just a regular old looking dude and he's got a white lab coat on. The other guy that's next to him is way taller. He has a lab coat on and I can't see his face. It's just a blur. His whole face is a blur. Even when I think about it right now, the thing's face is just a blur <laughs> to this day. And it, for some reason, too, that dream or whatever it was, was a while ago. And it seems like it just happened yesterday. It's like I can remember like putting that battery together. Like I'll never forget how to do that type thing. And as I keep clicking these on there, the guy that's a blur, I know that when he's talking, I'm just hearing it. But nothing's moving. Like his mouth isn't moving. In other words, he's just thinking things to me and I'm hearing it. The other guy, though, he's talking. The, the guy that just looks like a normal guy in a lab coat, he's talking to me and the one thinking things to me is getting upset because I keep asking now, you know, well, what is it going to, you know, what's it for? And that's when they let me know, basically it's a battery and it's going to power up. They're going to take this frame when I'm done putting it together, they're going to take that frame and basically put it onto another one that they're just building a bigger version of what I'm building in that frame. That's going to go onto another one. <laughs> and That's going to power up something. And, so then I start asking, well, what does it power up? Because for me, I'm a drag race guy. And if it even, I guess, even if you I'm do. a sleeper, however that works, that's all I can think about is I want to go fast too. You know, so whatever the, <laughs> whatever this is for, I want to know about it. So I can make my car go fast too. You know, that's how <laughs> I think about it. And, and so I'm asking too many questions and the big thing is just telling me, Hey, just finish the battery. And then I asked another question and then bam, instantly back in my room laying next to my wife and like I didn't wake up I was just there and it was very strange to that day I've never had a dream like that I've never I've never dreamt about that again that's never happened again to where it I've had out of out of body experiences since then but it's nothing like that that didn't seem like I've done the OBE things before it didn't seem anything like that it was very real very very real like even the weight of those cells like when i'm clicking them in i felt tired once i was back in bed and back awake i felt tired and then i also remember thinking don't drop this that was one of the main things my thoughts clicking those on was if you drop that and that blue stuff got out of there it was going to be a real bad thing whatever no, if, whatever that stuff was in there it would hurt you if it was an egg it was going to go like this yeah <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah that <laughs> so yeah, some people. Somebody has asked me before yeah. if uh, they thought I was building something for them. It's interesting. Because, yeah, you know, it's really I've been weird. Batteries my whole life, and I've never seen a battery like they had me build. That's so crazy. <laughs> it's fascinating. I love it. Yeah. But what's interesting too, and it may not be may not be related, but the, there's definitely a very strong similarity. So in one of my experiences. I, uh, in, in, you know, a little bit different. I remembered this like in a regression that I did, but I was up on a craft and there was a blue, like I called it what kind of looked like a plasma ball hovering above this table and they were trying to uh, get me to manipulate it. And the ball and inside the ball, the blue like energy was just kind of slowly swirling around. So as you're sitting there describing it, I was just kind of like, oh. That's what it looks like too. Like that, it looked like each one of those cells was alive. And when you yeah. put it on that that frame, it communicated with the other ones, and they were just flowing with this weird. Very cool. That's crazy cool. So then, did you ever find out like what 
this battery actually did like how like the mechanics of it how it worked it that that was another cell i was building it was going to go on a bigger battery that's all that's all that thing would say hmm. other than just finish the battery <laughs> that's all <laughs> that's all it told me and then like i said i asked too many questions i think and then i just that was it never got to oh. go back never got to do it again never dreamt about this again never but it is like it happened yesterday and it was a while ago what a stingy alien be like puny know, human huh? just build for me that's, that's <laughs> yeah oh that's crazy though that's really cool and i think sunny's sunny's had a number of downloads when, when yeah. that thing was talking to me and not using its mouth and i was just hearing it that wasn't that wasn't anything like to me when i think about it now that's too strange then that was just that's how that works like that that was no different than him talking to me like i wasn't amazed by that i didn't ask how come you're not how, how come your lips aren't moving i just wanted to know what the battery was for you know that i never even thought about that thing not looking like a human and then i swear then for some reason it seems like i could see it but mm -hmm. when i think about it it's just a blur I mean, <laughs> so are you able to blur. like remember any like slight details about it that like did it have kind of like a gray ish appearance or was it like some was it more humanoid? I kept, like I kept saying, I remember the hands and it not having five fingers. I don't okay. remember. I, it didn't have hands like us. That, that's one thing I do remember because the guy that was writing had a clipboard. And yeah. Then, yeah. The other that other thing didn't in this dream or whatever it was he, he had no clipboard and just yeah like i remember either something was wrong with his hands or he didn't have five fingers <laughs> like but he had us. fingers oh yeah it had okay something on there because he's pointing so i know he has fingers but that's how i remember his hand is it just didn't look like ours interesting it's pointing to the to oh, the area. It is, it just finish the battery <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just not letting me off easy. I'm thinking about that. <laughs> oh. Wow. So have you had any other experience? Like, have you ever seen any other weird beings or had any other experiences? Recently. Yeah, yeah, recently. Just before Valentine's Day. Uh, what? I, my, my God, my, not my godson, my uh, son-in-law was in the kitchen, in the kitchen, and I'm in my living room. And what divides that is our couch really there's no wall there it's a big entry thing and he's a good ways away from me though mm -hmm. and there's a bubble <laughs> it's funny it's just in one spot and it's halfway between the kitchen and the living room and i tell him hey man look how far this bubble made it in here because i thought he was in the kitchen washing his hands <laughs> he turned around and he's holding his hands up like this he's got grease all over him he was deboning a chicken with his hands oh my God. he goes i didn't wash my hands i didn't use the soap or anything you know and because i haven't washed my hands yet and i said and my my wife was there and I, I said is someone in the shower and she goes no and i go dude do you see this bubble and he goes no and i go come over here so he walks over to me i grab him and i pull him in close and then i point at it and i go you see it now and he goes oh yeah and it if you could picture a bubble that the way I describe it, I tell people it looked like somebody's eye when they have cataracts. It looked like it had that film mm. over it. Okay. And and it's not really moving. It's just in one spot. Like it's caught in a spider web you can't see or something. And it's just stationary. It's not floating around like a bubble does. In other words. So I point at it and he says he sees it. And he's, I still got him pulled in close to me. And I go, watch, I'm going to pop it. As soon as I got like this close to this bubble that's not moving, it shot straight up and through the roof. <laughs> and I mean fast. It went <laughs> and it went from not moving to I, I got this close to it to pop it. And then as soon as it did, I jerked my hand back and I looked at him and I went, what the f was that, man? <laughs> and he, I go, I've never seen nothing. And he's going, calm down, dude. It's okay. He tells me, it's okay. My mom tells me that those are spirits. And we see those in our house all the time. 
I told you I've never seen anything like that in my life. And he he's not freaked out at all. He he says he sees this <laughs> stuff, you know, he's seen it before and it was no big deal. And so I don't know. I still don't know what that was. But then that was just before Valentine's Day. And like a month ago, his mom passed away. OK, mm -hmm. after this happened, his mom passed away. Um, stuff started happening in his house the day she passed away. And then they have a security camera on their front porch and something mm -hmm. set it off. I showed Jim this video. So Jim has seen this video. There is an orb that just materializes on their porch in the camera and then starts floating around the porch. It goes down to the bottom. It goes off to the bottom and then off to the side of the porch and disappears. It is what? one of the, and it's the, yeah, I saw it's, it. It's for the say, and that just happened. That that just it's happened. a really good one. It's a good video. It, so I'm the only it, person that, that hasn't seen this amazing video, Sonny. Hey, Sonny, real? we Sonny, we got a hashtag uh, <laughs> the Osbournes for that one. They can put it on the show. I forgot about yes. that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but they think that's the same lady, his mom. They think that's his mom. That that orb that materializes. They think that's her. Oh. And Enzo's that's seen it the too. same lady. Okay. That yeah. Says you Enzo was with scared. us that night. Keep a adding to it, guys. Sure. Come on. Oh, yeah. Later on. Who else has seen it? Who else? <laughs> yeah, Lynn, but if you come on with us, you're sometimes it's late hours, so you better be ready yeah, to I stay know, right? awake. <laughs> I mean, like, just well, show me in the morning. Show me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> right? We were all on here late one night, and he came out in the garage to show me. He goes, Sonny, look what just happened. Like, it had just happened on, on their security camera, and he wanted to show me, and then I had him send me the video. And that's great. And that's did it look cool. like the one that you saw? Kind of that like cloudy? No, nothing like that. <laughs> the one I see was just a bubble that didn't move mm -hmm. until I tried to touch it. <laughs> that this one, this one, like, what? This... That one still gives me the chills. It was nothing but a bubble. And that's freaked me out more than anything I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> I never, it was just so spooky yeah. that I thought it was going to pop. And as soon as I tried to touch it, it shot straight. It, straight up through the ceiling that's all i can say because it disappeared so it mm. yeah i don't know and and look and he was there and my wife was there the two other people that seen that not just me mm. but yeah it was very very strange that was that's a very so cool. strange one and well, then we have um the Zeta connection paula hamden and cyan they talk about i mean they're on my shows on wednesdays um, and they talk about orbs. They see orbs all the time. And I think Cyan had put it in here earlier that an orb can be an ET or a spirit. So it's all that's life. That's what he said. They were spirits. That's what he was told that that was just a spirit. And it was nothing life. Dangerous. Life is everywhere in many, many different forms. Yeah. If, if, if I can ever get, <clears throat> get back to Albuquerque, my friend Stuart Brown has uh, used to I write for popular, popular science and stuff. He, his uh, very, very good friend is a retired, uh, I think it's Navajo, or maybe Apache, uh, su Supreme Court Justice for the, for the, uh, su the Indian nation. Yeah, nice. And I asked, <clears throat> there's been all sorts of reports about Dulce, New Mexico, mm -hmm. and it's right on the Canadian, not Canadian, right on the Colorado border. And, he, and uh, William said that <clears throat> he speaks both Apache and Navajo. Oh, wow. And he's very, very, very well respected in the community. And he's asked some of the elders if they would be willing to be to have a taped interview on on the spirits that they see all the time. And they said, yeah, probably. So hopefully later on this summer, <clears throat> we'll make arrangements to go up to the uh, Dulce Pueblo and meet with the... Uh, not next to the witch doctor, but the medicine man and a few and a few other key people there. It will be in their native tongue, and William will, will do the. Uh, uh, my mind just went blank. You know, he, he'll 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 do the. Uh, oh, jeez, I hate it. Oh, poor Jim, you're so tired. We were talking about orbs. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I had a yeah no, I'm, I, my mind has just gone blank for some reason. I just got off. I mentioned earlier to Lynn, and Sonny knows about it too. I, I drove 15 hours straight on Thursday, and I'm still suffering the consequences. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to get the hell out of California before it you know, got pushed <laughs> off to the ocean uh, and yeah. get away from the gas prices. Uh, but oh. uh, 
he was he was gonna be the interpreter and that was the right word i was looking for for some reason it was hidden in my brain somewhere and they've mm -hmm. tended they've tenderly agreed to do that and they don't speak it you now the the uh dulce pueblo is such a closed community they're most of their residents have never ever left the, the uh, Dulce Pueblo, the, mm. you know, the reservation. Yeah, and uh, and they they're really they're really uh, weary of uh, non locals. But you know, William William said that he's talked to him and and they're willing to, they're willing to do it on tape. So it's going to be hopefully it's going to be mind blowing if it happens. Plus, yeah. there's there's a vantage point of overlooking Dulce that the federal government or anybody else have no control over because it's Indian nation. And we're going to, you know, we're going to hopefully camp out for a couple of two or three days overlooking the entrance to the military facility there at Dulce. Mm -hmm. See what happens. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. I was just going to ask you, like, what do you think? So I, I'm sure you've, you've probably heard the stories of the Dulce base, like under the mountain, uh, wh what do you think? If, is there any truth to that? Like for all of you guys, what do you guys think about that one? I find that one fascinating. I've, I've been hearing about Dulcie since the sixties. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was just, it was interesting. <clears throat> and I've been wanting to go there, but I, up until, up until just a couple of years ago when uh, Stu Brown introduced me to his buddy, William, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, I had no, I had no idea how I was going to be able to pull it off. Now maybe I maybe I uh, I'll be able to figure out how to you know to be able to get in there, and ha have a taped interview with the translator, and and hopefully it'll be earth shattering. I don't know, but yeah, that's amazing. And like the story of Paul Schneider too. Do you guys know that story, Sunny and Spooky and Jim? I don't. Guys I, don't I don't know. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Jim, do you know Paul Schneider? This is no, an no. older one. He he died under very strange circumstances. Supposedly he it was suicide, but he somehow strangled himself with his own excuse me, young lady. Um strangled himself with his own catheter cord. Um, which it, there's some technicalities there that I don't know if that's possible, but um, <laughs> <laughs> he took the piss out of himself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Poor God. But there was this whole like so he was the one that kind of started the whole I don't I think he started it, started the whole idea of like the Dulce Mesa having an underground base, you know, with several stories and stuff. And yeah. he talked about how he worked there and he went down several levels and um I think he accidentally went to a level he wasn't supposed to, and there were all these grays there and they were doing these weird like genetic hybrid experiments. And he's talking about all these kind of gruesome like animal human hybrid weird things that he saw and somehow he got into a shootout with the greys and they had these because he had a gun he was in the military um and i can't remember what it was because i think he didn't know they were there or something it was, it was weird but anyways they shot at him because he shot one of the greys so they shot at him you know who i'm talking about now sonny and mm -hmm. so he's yeah. missing like whoop, whoop, that yeah, much. they were shooting plasma <laughs> balls at him not bullets <laughs> yeah. yeah so it like just yeah. went cut off like part mm -hmm. of his like his fingers and he was missing it was on like a diagonal um yeah, yeah it's really interesting and so he came out and started talking about all of this and then sort of died under these very mysterious circumstances that they then said was suicide uh which was is questionable but yeah he used to be on all of the like conference circuits and He's fascinating. I definitely look him up if you haven't heard his whole story. There's there's a yeah. lot more to it. For yeah. sure. Really crazy. So that I'm always saying, that's always gotten me curious because it's a very far out there story. And when I hear stories like that, I always think, why would you make that up? It almost doesn't even sound believable. Like it's very, you know, very hard to kind of believe that because the detail that he goes into, like all of the things that he's talking about, I'm almost like, if you were going to make something up, wouldn't you make it a little more believable? So to me, that always makes me wonder, is it true? Is it not true? I don't really know. It's very strange. I mean, if there's, if, if the person is giving a, a tremendous amount of information in detail and you think it's kind of over the top, it is over the top because stuff like that 
is is you know, it is real. I mean, he's seeing something. He's describing it. He's telling you what he's seeing. If it was, if he was just trying to make a name for himself, just mm-hmm. just like he said, he would have been a little bit uh, not as outrageous in his description yeah. of what happened and and where it happened and, and whatever. So it's um, I got to believe him. Yeah, I think so, too. I mean, he sounded like when he spoke, he spoke with conviction, you know, and he sounded like it. But, you know, like I certainly can't dismiss anyone's stories for sounding over the top. I mean, my experiences sound over the top to a lot of people, I'm sure. But, um, you know, so I'm not. But isn't it? It's like funny. I was just talking to to Dave Hurley about this the other day, which was like, it's so funny how those of us like kind of even if we've been in this community for a while, we have those those stories where we kind of draw the line like that's hard for me to swallow and like even though i've heard a lot of stories from experiencers and i try to always stay open-minded and i always admit i can't say that it's not true but there are those stories where it's just kind of like "Mm, i don't know (laughs) do you guys ever have that same kind of experience yeah yeah but (laughs) I tell Spooky I'm not and Chad. To pull anyone out. <laughs> no, I I tell Spooky and Chad like some of the guests we have on. Sometimes I hear stories that I don't believe, maybe, yeah. but as long as they believe it to be mm. true, and yes, yeah, like um, some people say they see a sign that was left from maybe Bigfoot. They don't have to be an alien. It could be from Bigfoot. Well, maybe I think that sign was left from somebody practicing witchcraft in the woods because oh you should show me pictures i could tell you (laughs) (laughs) you would probably you would probably agree with me so but i don't if i point that out and they're really like no that's not what it is then i don't bring it up over and over and over as long as they believe that's what that is then that's what that is to them as long as they're being honest yeah. For me, I've just seen so many things in my life, um, both, you know, uh, in, in, in daytime and dreams and in deepest meditation that I really don't try to discount or discredit anyone's stories that they tell because I say to myself, who am I to say if somebody saw what they saw or not? Because people probably think I'm out of my mind from, you know, it's been many, <laughs> many years that I've been telling my stories. Yeah. And I know that I've been, you know, people have told me that I'm mad in the head, but mm-hmm. still, as long as it's been, it's still the same way for me. And I, you know, all I can do is just, you know, I don't, I don't know other people's stories. All I know is mine. I'm, I'm not an expert on UFOs or aliens, but I am an expert on what's happened to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's true. And we can't prove it that, it, or we can't prove that it didn't happen. So, but I'm still, I know like, Sonny just drove through the uh, desert on his way back from Vegas, and I've done that many, many times because we used to go to Vegas at least once a year. And yeah. there's something about all those deserty mountains, and you just have to wonder: can there be nothing going on inside of those mountains? And I see many, many times uh, uh, UFOs, orbs in the sky driving through those deserts. So there's yeah. a lot going on out there. When, when we went through there, that launch facility was hopping. That every oh, light right. on was, it was, yeah, every light was on. It, I don't know what they were doing, but it mm-hmm. looked busy. Mm. Well, I do think, I do, I mean, I know that we have, and Jim, you may know of this, I don't know. Uh, I know we have the capability to tunnel, you know, like these, make these huge, large tunnels, like into mountains. We can, I mean, we have Absolutely. tunnels that go through mountains, but, uh, you know, we have the capability to to dig down and, and do an underground facility for sure. And supposedly, you know, right. Pat has a huge underground facility. Never so got you have that to one out of my dad. But. You have to wonder what advanced uh, technology and <laughs> could do to those mountains. Yeah. Right. It's so crazy. I mean, I love when, it. when, when Dave, when Dave threw off, he's the SR 71 pilot that chased a UFO and it left him in the dust. When he became the facility manager at area 51, uh, I said, did you find any underground facilities? And he said, if there had been any at Area 51, and that was his only area that he was charged to be the facility manager of, he said, I would have known. And I looked. He said, you know, there was nothing in Area 51. He said, mm-hmm. but 
On the other side of the Papoose Range, which is the backdrop for Area 51 that most people have seen, uh, they have the, the ability to do drill through solid granite <clears throat> at a foot an hour. We're talking about a 36 foot diameter hole. And that's how that's how they used to, when they were going straight down 15 to 1800 feet when they're doing underground nuclear testing and also when they built Yucca Mountain. And these, you know, and and uh, Elon wants to you know, wants to do a high speed tunnel between uh, Vegas and uh, L.A., I think it is. And I know the city of Seattle, they had Big Bertha and they were going to get rid of the Alaska Way viaduct. And someone forgot to tell them that there's a steel piling going down right in the middle of their their route. And they they broke this multi-million ton uh, earth boring machine. And, and it was it took them, 15, I think it was 15 months to fix it. They had to dig a hole big enough and get cranes big enough to pull the thing out, repair it, put it back in, and then start again from scratch. And, oh, and take the metal pole out of the way. Lynn, I mean, it was, have it was you a ever- big... Lynn, have, have you ever pulled up Area 51 before on like Google Maps and looked at it? I um, I haven't ever pulled it up. I've seen pictures of it and I've seen other people do it, but okay. I haven't ever pulled it up. If you do that, you got to do it with Jim. If you ever oh. wondered what a building was, he could just tell you what it is. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, who's that... this building right here kind of situation? Yeah. <laughs> One day you need to pull it up and share it. And when you point stuff out, it, yeah, it's pretty neat finding out what all those little, I've looked at it before a bunch of times, but I didn't know what all those buildings were. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of new buildings out there and they keep, they keep expanding. <clears throat> and they have one that's way, way, way south of the uh, main part of the base. And it's a, and it's a, uh, it's probably about five miles from the for the heart from the heart of the uh, base, and you and the, the taxiway goes goes down to the south end of, of the launch area for the main runway, and right off of it is a another hangar, and it's totally isolated, and it's relatively new. It wasn't there a couple of years ago, and it's to be that far apart, that far away it means it either. Whatever they're doing is even more secret than everything else they're doing at Area 51, <clears throat> or that whatever they're using for propellant or or or, or motion or however you want to call it is so toxic mm-hmm. that they have to keep it far away from people. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a lot of interesting things there. Years ago, there was a gentleman named Pete Ames. Pete was uh, deputy director for program security for special projects. And he's the one who interrogated me for two hours uh, during Desert Storm because I had written a book on the F-117 and I wrote too much. Mm. <laughs> and he said, I told him, I submitted it to you and you jerks didn't do anything about it. Uh, <laughs> but he, yeah, he said, there's, you know, there's, there's stuff out there that uh, the, the, the general public can't know. It's it's either too frightening or it's uh, it's uh, it's it's beyond what you can you know, what you, you can really wrap your mind around. And someday, but he said they were working. Now this is before nine eleven. They were working to get a, a tour of Area fifty one mm-hmm. of uh, journalists, aviation journalists, and he said. Your name will be on the list if it ever happens, if you ever survive that long. Nice. So I'm just I'm just hoping that one of these days I'll get it and I'll get a, a, an email or a phone call or a knock on the door. Hell, come with us. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that happen too. I mean, there's nothing worse than having the doorbell ring at 5 a.m. in the middle of the week. I go downstairs and I I have my I have my 357 behind my back, <laughs> and I, I look in the side window and there's two nice looking military types in civilian clothes, and I so I open the door and say How can I help you? I said Are you James Goodall? And I said Yes. I said we, May we come in? We have some questions for you. I said Sure. Uh, it was the guys from Naval Investigative Services, and I I had uh, asked about. I'd asked the commanding general of the third Marine air wing, a paint scheme for 
a Marine airplane. Mm -hmm. And they thought I was trying to be a spy or something like that. And I said, and I'm talking to these guys. I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll fix you some coffee because it's really early in the morning. I know you probably, I'm not sure where you came from, but it, it wasn't, you know, I lived in Minneapolis at the time. And uh, so I, you know, we, we go through our you know, back and forth, back and forth. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll show you what. This thing has just been declassified. So I went down to the basement and took out the SR-71 flight manual and put it on, on, the, on the table. I said, now, 10 years ago, if I'd asked about this, then you're justified to come and visit me. But for me, asking the paint scheme of an OA-4M Skyhawk from the Marine Corps, they don't give Marine Corps anything classified. They don't. And any airplane flown by the Marines either has to be rusty or leak oil for it to be an official Marine Corps airplane. <laughs> they, they didn't appreciate my they didn't appreciate my sense of humor, but we had we had a nice conversation. So, Hilarious. but one of these days, I, mean, I, I hope I hope that the doorbell rings and uh, I go up there and it will be a guy in an ill ill fitting suit and brogans and said uh, we're going for a ride. We're going to take you for a tour. Yes, and hopefully that hopefully that day will come. People, I hope so. Hope do you think too. we're still keeping anything there though, or do you think that like too many people know about Area Fifty One now? Do you know how to get there? Do, do, do it, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of the, the people who are interested in Area Fifty One have no idea where to go, how to get yeah. there, how do you snoop on them? Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. And. I even you know, I even gave a, a, a talk at a uh, well last year uh, last year's uh, MUFON convention in in, uh, in Las Vegas. My my talk was how to snoop on our government in and around Area 51 without getting shot. Nice. <laughs> or if you if you really want to sneak into Area 51, it's relatively easy. It takes a horse, but you just they have sensors out there. They can, you know, they can, they hear the animals. They can, I, I don't know if they have, if they may even have sensors that will can sniff you out. Hmm. If that's the case, then put a Tyvek suit on and do it on a cold night, but do it at night on, on bareback. Cause you're not gonna be able to use a, a saddle. Cause they see a horse wandering around with a saddle. Then there's gotta be a guy <laughs> attached to that somewhere. Yeah. Or you can always do what agent X did. And this is back in the early nineties. Agent, agent X is a, um, uh, yeah, I was just reading uh, from. Oh yeah, I was happy to find the Midland mailbox and a little yeah. little alien in. Yeah, really? and that mailbox, that black mailbox has been stolen so many times, and now he just That's gets it. his mail general delivery in in uh, Ash Springs, uh, right side of Alamo. But um, it's just. <laughs> My train of thought went. I'm. I'm sorry. I distracted you. We were talking about yeah. how to get near air, alien or alien area fifty one without oh. getting shot. Oh, oh yeah. My my friend Agent X. He's a retired special forces guy. He Wait, put you on know a, a guy named Agent X. That's cool. That's, yeah. <laughs> I mean that's that's his he has a real name, but right. yeah. there's a, there's a group of us in the '90s. We were called the Dreamland Interceptors. Oh, Stu Stu Brown was um, who was a writer and a very good journalist. Uh, he's the Minister of Words. Michael Dornheim, who was the senior writer for Aviation Week, he was the Ayatollah, hundred percent Irish, <laughs> pale white skin, long beard, long hair, but we called him the Ayatollah. Oh my God! <laughs> uh, another guy is, uh, we, we we call Zero. Uh, brilliant guy, but it, he just got a nickname Zero. Mine was mine was either the Great One or Senator. <laughs> Stu Brown gave me that. Um, but Agent X put on his sniper suit, you know, and he crawled from uh, just past, you know, just down the bottom of Freedom Ridge. And he he crawled all the way within about 150 yards of the main runway. Wow. It took him a, it took him a day and a half. And uh, he said that people he had people drive by and walk by within 150 feet of him. Wow. And he's I said, well, how'd you eat? How'd you go to the bathroom? He said, K 
carefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. determination, a day and a half. And then uh, and then he, he felt that he was he was going to be at risk if he stayed much longer. Went out of, he was running out of water. Yeah, because he had to bring all his water with him. So he crawled back out. I said, did you see anything? And he said, I heard some stuff, uh, but I didn't. He said, I, I didn't see a damn thing in, a, in, in a, almost a week that I was out there. And Now, within I, 150 yards, was he like legally too close? Yeah, by about 14 miles. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from from the official border of Area 51 to the main runway, I think it's about 10 miles. Oh wow, that's crazy! And when you're when when we were on Freedom Ridge, <laughs> and I I helped Glenn Campbell, not the singer, but the Area 51 research guy. Yeah, uh, I, I was with him when we were finding a route up to the top of uh, uh, Freedom Ridge. I don't know what the real name was, but we gave the gave it the name Freedom Ridge. And they had blocked these tr these these roads. They put big berms up, and we just poured more, put more rocks. We got buckets and shovels. It actually made a bridge over the blockage. And as as we're driving up, I'm walking in front of uh, Glenn's four by four, and I'm walking up. And Glenn says he could. Uh, he's listening to radio, the radio broadcasts, you know, on, the, on military radio, and he says. Oh my God, they're almost at the top. Like, oh, Jesus, this has been like an effing drive in movie. And it went to one, one day, we had like 15 cars up there all lined up overlooking <laughs> Area 51. And it just, and shortly thereafter, they took White Sides and Freedom of Ridge away for, for the safety of the general public. Now it was for, to, to keep their secrets secret. But where there's a will, there's a way. So. Yeah. And anybody, anybody who's interested in going out to Area 51, uh, drop me a line. I'll tell you the best way to go and 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 how not to get caught. If you get caught, you're in you're in deep kimchi. It's gonna it's gonna be a, a an experience and a half, and you don't want to get caught with your car in there because they'll impound it, and you have to go all the way to Pinoche, which is 100 miles away, to retrieve it. It's probably a rent a car and it's probably not going to be towed nicely. So you're going to have damage. You're going to have attorney fees. You're going to, you're going to be interrogated like you've never been interrogated before. Even, even by your wife after you, yeah, after she finds lipstick on your collar, <laughs> that'd be a piece of, piece of cake from what those guys will do to you. I know the, uh, first, the first time I actually drove into area 51, I was with John Lear. And uh, we were at his memorial service last weekend. It was wonderful, by the way. And we're, yeah. we're coming up, and we're, there's, a, there's a guard shack, and you can see the whole base. And we get, and this is, uh, this is pre, this is uh, early nineties. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we both get out. It's a very nice looking young man comes out in black utilities. He, you know, he's not, he's not holding his gun. He's just coming out. Said, hey. He said, can I help you guys? He said, he said, what, he said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, we're bird watchers. We just saw the road and decided we wanted to see where it went. And I mean, you can look at the whole base, everything. And then John said, you mind if we take a picture of your guard shack? And about that same time, another guy comes out of the, out of the, the guard shack, who was a reject from the NFL because he was too big. <laughs> He has no neck. I mean, it goes straight down to his shoulder blades. He's putting a 30 round clip into his M16 and, oh and, my God. and putting a, a round in the chamber. And he said, if you take a picture of the guard shack, you're going to be interviewed by some very, very unfriendly types for a long, long time. And it's <laughs> something you will regret. All right, John, let's go. We're heading home. <laughs> <And off we're laughs> heading. So. But why? Uh, like, my question is why? What What are people going to get from a picture of the guard shack? Is there anything like classified because, that they would get from that? Because I hadn't gone up to White Sides yet to take a picture of the whole base. And it, no, and I mean, Google, why were they against you taking the picture? Because you're photographing a secret location. Mm. 
You Area can see 50. it from public land, though, right? No, I was. I w we were three miles inside Area 51, as far as the official border goes. Oh, okay. So, gotcha. so they don't play fair. They don't play by <clears throat> the rules that you and I normally play. You know, play by. They make their own. If you wanted rules. to go in there, you would take out the guard shacks. So, you, if you know where one's at, it makes it easier. Gotcha. So, yeah. Got you don't yeah. Want to take a picture of it. <laughs> you would be in big trouble. The, the, the one thing the one thing you can do <clears throat> now if you have a white four-door pickup truck probably a ford i'm not a ford fan but that's what that's what a lot of the, a lot of those guys drive then you drive you, you go up on the you, you head towards rachel you go over what uh, queen you know, queen something summit coming into into rachel and just before you get there is these we call they call it 10 mile road and it goes and it's heading to the bombing range but if you go down there, there you'll see a couple roads going off to the left one goes towards the groom mine but they have sensors in there go a little bit farther you can see there's a a, a trail where it's, where someone has gone in and they're they're uh, filling up water troughs for mm -hmm. uh for the for cattle and <clears throat> and if you go there and and, and you don't look suspicious then you can be looking around, doing whatever you're doing. Then you make yourself a low observable type of uh, uh, tent with camouflage netting on it. You're in public land. So there's not a damn thing they can do about it. And anything that takes off from Area 51 has to fly right over Immigrant Valley and, and over Rock Springs Valley where, where Rachel is, and you'll see it. And the real, real spooky stuff I mean, the ultra spooky stuff always flies on weekends. Mm. And the reason why is 90, 95 to 98% of the people that are cleared to work at Area 51 are not cleared to see that whatever they're hiding on flying just on weekends. Mm -hmm. And they'll make an announcement. They'll make an announcement that if you don't have a blue or a red or a yellow security badge, you must go in a windowless building. You're not allowed yeah. to see stuff. That was back. That was back in the '60s. I was there officially once, and that's this is 1964 when I was at Edwards. I was there to support three programs: the XB70, the YC141, and the Blackbird, mm -hmm. and for ground-based telemetry. And I had to, we had to go to a an off-site location to install some equipment at another base. Well, I didn't know it at the time. But it was Area 51. Didn't see anything. We flew in a Fairchild F-27. The windows were blocked by 90 to 120 minutes. It was 92, yeah, 90 to about 100 minute flight. We landed. We taxied next to a hangar. There was four, two buses at either side. They said, "Get out, look straight ahead, go right into the hangar." We had box lunches, so we didn't have to leave. Uh, God, I saw, heard all sorts of fun, fun noises, but didn't know what the hell it was. It was actually the the A twelves taken off or engine running, and then uh, after five hours, we took off, flew back to Edwards, and so I at the time didn't know where I'd gone. Today I know I was at Area fifty one. So, uh, but every everything that's really spooky flies on the weekends, and. Mm. 99.9% .9 of the people out here, except for people in this group, never look up. I go outside. I'm always looking up. You know, I live, I live here in, a, in an area that has no street lights. We have very little light pollution. And I go out in my backyard and I can see the Milky Way. That's how, that's how clear it is out there. And I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put a lawn chair out by the pool and just sit there and stare for hours hoping to see something hmm. and and in all the times they've been out in the desert and all the times i've you know been at, you know been snooping on the government i have not seen a year i have not seen something i couldn't explain uh, and that's about as i mean that's about as frustrating as as they come i mean i've seen videos <coughs> oh. excuse me i've seen videos of uh, that people have taken I said why, why can't it be me uh mm. 
on, uh, on the Janet Fly into your area, they only play one song. What is the song over, over and over? I and think over. it's uh, Neil Diamond's Coming to America. He said, oh, according to Michael Shratt. No. That's horrible. Uh, <laughs> That's oh. torture. Hey, hey, if, if any if anybody would know, it would be Michael. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, I've known Michael almost 20 years, and he's like my kid. I think okay. the world of him, I've, I've, I've pushed him as hard as I could or as hard as I felt to yeah. – uh, he has no he, – he, I don't even know where to put it. He, he, he doesn't have a good father figure, and I'm it. Mm. So he's really he's really screwed now, but uh, uh, because I I pushed I pushed him I pushed him in to, to, to do a YouTube channel. Yeah, he's doing it. Blue Room Media. I said you have a, you have enough information and illustrations and supporting documents to do a hundred books like he did. Mm. Uh, you know, was it yeah, Dark Files? Yeah, the Dark Files bit. And yeah, he's Michael's still absolutely it. he's brilliant. He oh no, he is. He is there and that was our best show when you guys were on uh, the chop shop. It was amazing. Yeah, we were so blessed. I mean, um and Mike Michael will come on anytime I ask him to come on. So uh, yeah, let's that, I mean, I'll, I'll ask I'll ask him next I'll ask for next week if you if you'll come well, on. Well Ben and Joe, so I think, awesome. might be coming on next week, but the week after that, if Michael can do that, that would oh, be awesome. Cool. Oh, I, I'm looking for advantage. I got to give a ration of crap for not. Hey, there you go. Yeah, save it, up. save it up. Let it build yes. for the week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Build the hype. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, somebody has a question for you, Jim, if you're open to it. Uh, can you break down the heads up display? This in the two UAP videos that Pentagon released. I think one in Jacksonville, the other was in. San so I, I pulled one up. Um, are you able to tell what the different things on the heads up display mean? It, 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 depending on how sharp they are. Okay, let me uh, let me share this, and then let's see if you'll be able to see. I think they degrade them a lot uh, for on purpose. And let me see if I can make it like full screen. Here we go. Um, okay. Yeah, so the, the, the angle is that's that's how the airplane is flying. This one here. Uh, they're at a negative two degree. Um, it gives that. It gives. Uh, Let's see, slave is this, like that, meaning that, they have that locked on, right? The the the, the, T, the T A C T S that's the pod that that's they're using to uh, to capture the image, and it's and it's it's on a, in a slave mode. There's a thing on the on the right that says slave. Yeah. It means yeah. it's locked on, so it's being slaved looking for the, uh, the for the object. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know what this L and S and B S T stand for? No, not off the top of my head. Okay. And then this is LST, and then it has some numbers, 1688, 1688. A lot of the time, that's that that's, uh, could be altitude. Mm -hmm. um, UFC setup? I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. I'm not a pilot, else, else I'd be able to yeah. you know, you know, tell you right away. But interesting. But the uh, and the thing is, the thing is on this on this on the uh, tack pod that's used that's tracking this thing, it has high resolution. Mm. This is this is blurred out. Yeah, it's garbage. Yeah, it's garbage. Crazy. And the and the, and the other thing, there's been there's been too many there's been too many instances where reconnaissance aircraft have photographed them as they've maybe flown over or or, or their side looking uh, uh, cameras can you know can see stuff on the side, and it's sharp. There was an instance that I uh, uh, a friend of a friend of mine was in security service. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, and he said, "There's uh, it says there was a, an RB thirty six flying over the central part of the United States, and they were flying in a formate with a formation of discs. They come up to them. The guys are photographing them through their reconnaissance bubble. There's twenty seven guys in an RB thirty six. It's a ten engine monster. They're using eight by ten graphics cameras." And they know what they're doing, so there is a just sub to Blue Room Media. Who, Michael Schratt channel, right? Yeah. Oh. 
They just sub subscribe to it. That's all they're saying. Oh, okay. I thought it was. I thought I, I looked at it and had my glasses on. I thought you just snubbed. No, you. Just, you know, oh no, we wouldn't put that oh, up. No. Oh no, no. I, trust okay, you. Good. I didn't I think you would. Them a new one in the chat if they said that. Yeah. No. <laughs> Blue, the Blue Room Media uh, again, Michael. He's been carrying around this <clears throat> three ring binder. It's it. It must weigh forty pounds. And he said, Michael, you don't need to bring all your crap. I said, no, this is only one of 260 <laughs> some odd binders I have. Jeez. He says, just bring your book and a few support new stuff, not something that weighs 400 pounds. So ho hopefully uh, he will uh, you know, you know, he, he will be uh, fly around and travel a little bit lighter from now on. So I like when he brings the binder. That thing's packed full of information. Yeah. I mean, but it's it's just it's it's too much. It's too much. Now, if it was just one on one, and he was going to spend, say, the say he came to the Boston area and he wanted to you know, spend three or four days with Lynn, going through one of his binders. That's how long it would take. And he has two hundred and sixty some of them, and he has hundreds of four drawer filing cabinets in various locations filled with ufo stuff and uh, i made i made a deal for him i hope it happens uh, to get to have access to all of john lear's stuff oh that would be amazing yeah have him go through that wow yeah i've, I've known i've known I, i've known lear since the early 70s and i've yeah. watched his daughters grow up from just little girls to oh, nice. good looking women now. <laughs> so, uh, and I talked to Allie Lear at his uh, uh, memorial service and he mm -hmm. said, well, what, what can you tell me about Michael? I said, one, he's a straight shooter as they come. There is no BS with Michael. He, he doesn't state his opinion. He's like Sir, Sergeant Joe Friday in Dragnet. The facts, man, are just the facts, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. all it is. And everything that he puts down, either in the Blue Room Media or in in his uh, uh, in his book, and hopefully he'll volume two will come here pretty soon. He mm -hmm. said he has all the supporting documents. I mean, police reports, you know, military reports, FAA reports, uh, first person accounts, and then he takes all that information for. A particular event with with a hand hand drawn uh, stuff from the from the you know, the original you know the original eyewitness, and then he pays to have an artist do a rendering based on all the information, and he does this all the time. That 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 is Michael's life. Yeah. He he decided <clears throat> he decided as a young guy that that was going to be his calling. He was going to go out and do what he had to do to get to gather up as much information and none of it is going to be vaporware or, mm -hmm. or BS. It is, it's, you know, it's all hard, you know, hard evidence. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's just, and I, and I just, I absolutely love his presentations too. If you haven't, if you haven't had a joy of watching one of his, on his blue room media or, uh, see him, you know, see him at a MUFON function now. He's going to be in Denver uh, in July, mm -hmm. and he's going to give a presentation on his on his probably his his newest or his best stuff. And if you miss it, yeah, uh, it's it you're missing a lot. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be there, but my wife is going to have a uh, uh, an hour long brain brain mm -hmm. scan MRI. Yeah. Looking to see if cancer has gone anywhere else in her head. So yeah, got to be there for uh, that. Yeah, yeah, and that's on that's on the eighth or the seventh, mm -hmm. and I think the function starts on the eighth. So I can't I can't make it. So yeah. is that in in June or May? That that is. Uh, what the um, is that May or June? What move on or? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Ju no July. Oh July. No, July. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So. Good, good old Ann Schrat, make it happen, Lynn. Jim will make it happen. <laughs> I will have nothing to do with it whatsoever. <laughs> no, and, and, and again, I, I met him I, at UFO Con. Very nice guy. I, I'm, I am proud to say that that uh, he is a very dear friend of mine, 
and I and he he got a he got a contract job here in Oro Valley, Arizona, just because Jim Goodall lives in Oro Valley. What? Yeah, I mean, yeah. he says I, I came I came I came here because I want I knew I knew where you lived. And I wanted to be able to say, hey, can we get together? And I said, sure. I said, but he's there 10 minutes later. Aww, so, that's so nice. So I and I and I I just I thank the world of him. And yeah. and the I, and the world should thank Michael for everything he's done. He's done an incredible Absolutely. job. His book is amazing. He um actually Dave Scott, he gave Dave a copy of his book and Dave at UFO Con and Dave let me borrow it. I still have it. I have to mail it to him. Um, but I was, it was so, so Dave, let me borrow. It was really just to look through it and it was amazing, but I got so excited. Let me, let me grab it. I'm going to show you because in my regression, my very first regression, I described going up to a craft in what looked like a bubble, like a big giant bubble. And I'd never heard of anybody else talk about it. There's one in the book. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. You got like a big, my butt right in your face. Okay. Hold on. I was looking at it and I was like, oh, show, the, show, show the front cover. Oh, yes, I will. Thank you. Yes. Dark files. Wow. It's fantastic. Cool. It's that, like, yes, these artists renditions. I can't see it. Mm -hmm. the book's so yeah. Weird. And did you, did you read the dedication? No, I didn't. Let me see. Hold on. Is it, um, I'm assuming it might be <laughs> to one Jim Goodall. Ah, this book is dedicated to Jim Goodall. Shocking. <laughs> Author, researcher, historian, maverick, chaser of spooky aircraft and, and things that go bump in the night. Thank you for your friendship, support, inspiration, and believing in me. That's so nice. Yeah, that's, I just think the word. I got his first copy, too. So I, that's if, if they were serial numbered, I would have had, I, I have number one. Oh, so really? I, yeah. <laughs> No, I'm I'm proud to call him my friend. He's As such a nice guy. He is. He doesn't. He doesn't have. He doesn't have a dishonest, evil body or or bone in you know in his in his body. I mean, he's just. Yeah. He's an anomaly. That is true. But a great like one. Just talking to. I was just talking to somebody who was describing, one of like a guy that looked just like this on one of my shows just recently. So if you're listening, if you're looking, who was that? Oh my gosh. Oh, that's going to drive me crazy. I'm going to have to think about it now and let them know that this person's in here. Um, that's so crazy. But, but I, told, I told Michael, rather than taking your binder, I mean, literally it's this thick. Right. It's just like as big as he is. And <laughs> yeah, damn near. I said, just bring your book and do another book. This way you'll have even more stuff to share and you're not, you're not throwing your back out. Or you're not having the airport saying, "Are you stealing lead weights or something?" Because your your bag weighs four hundred pounds. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. Look at this. Do you wow. see this? Yep. It's a bubble. I saw mm. that and I was like, "What? What?" I thought I was crazy for thinking it looked like a bubble, like the thing that I saw. That's so crazy. Detail view of glass bubble UFO with occupants seen by multiple eyewitnesses in Las Rosas. I don't know where Las we Rosas talked, is. In Grand Canary Island. We talked about those bubbles before, Lynn. We said that's Did how you? the witches travel in the Wizard of Oz. They have to travel. Glenda, Glenda oh, the Glenda, good witch. Yeah, Glenda has a bubble. You're right. Yeah. Do you think that was soft disclosure? <laughs> in the Wizard hey, of Oz. Who knows? <laughs> The knows. Yeah. Have you seen the? Have you seen any of the orbs that uh, Chris Bledsoe has put up uh, pictures of, where they have you can see faces inside the orbs? I haven't seen his, but I have uh, Cyan actually, who was just talking about the orbs earlier. Uh, they, mm. she and Paul, have pictures of orbs with faces in them too. It's pretty nice. crazy. The Bledsoes yeah. have one that <laughs> you, you know, they have this one family dog that was really old when it passed away. And they they say that they can see the dog inside the orb, and I have to say, it really is convincing when you see it. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow! Like yeah, Chris Bledsoe like puts all dog. his he puts all his orbs up on uh, Instagram as the pl best place to see him for me that I, I, I notice. Follow him on there. I'll have to do that. Yeah, he puts up uh, orb videos almost every night. That's so cool. That's crazy. Did I ever tell you guys about the orb that I had in my house when I had Travis Walton's luggage in here? <laughs> 
<laughs> I think I did remember hearing you say that. <laughs> yeah, I was helping yeah, I was yeah. helping Tom Reed put on a convention here in Massachusetts, and I was the only one that's local. We were putting it on in Salem, and Travis's Travis was coming in to speak, and he flew in. And his luggage got lost. And so they gave the airline my address since I was the only local person. And I was right near right near where they all were. Um, and so I, I got the luggage delivered to my house. And so I was taking a picture to send it to Travis to let him know that I had it. And I've looked everywhere for this picture before anybody asks. Like, I can't find it. As I'm taking the picture, this orb like it's like flying right over his mm-hmm. luggage. And I was just like, what <laughs> is happening? It's crazy. <laughs> I was like, of this course, it's Travis Walton's luggage. Life is right. all around us. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Oh, goodness. Jim, you got high hopes for me, my man. Shrat, Goodall, and Bledsoe make it happen, Lynn. I'm not the Wizard of Oz, speaking of the Wizard. <laughs> no, but I if anybody can make it happen. And spooky. <laughs> I mean, how yeah. do you know how do how do you know you're not the Wizard of Oz? Maybe you maybe you are, and no one's told you yet. Oh, uh, see, this is or why he, I keep or, you around, Jim. This she's definitely why. the good witch. <laughs> yeah. I was married. I was married to a though. bad witch, so yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, someone someone posted uh, something on Facebook <laughs> yesterday. It says, "What's the leading cause of divorce?" And my answer was marriage. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah, not wrong. You're not no, wrong. No, no. <laughs> and and I, I have I have the un, I, I think it's it's not unfortunate from my perspective, but other people find it unfortunate. Uh, is that I I can find humor in almost anything. No, no matter how disgusting or, or obnoxious or whatever, I can find some humor in it. If I, oh, yeah, and it. And I don't even have to think about it. I look at it and all of a sudden it just pops into my mind. Mm. Or out of my mouth, one of the two. <laughs> and, and, and like my T, I, I said this before, but like my TIs in basic training told me, he said, good all, said you have everything going for you, but your mouth. <laughs> and I was, that was 60 years ago and oh. I, I still have everything going but me, for me, but my mouth at times. <laughs> That's hilarious. My teacher said it in a nicer way. Be like Lynn is a great student, but she talks too much. Oh, <laughs> well, look at me yeah. now. I got a YouTube channel with like 400 right? people. What? Jim Goodall's with us, <laughs> and Jim Goodall yeah. on here with me. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at me now, teach. Yes, oh, so this is cool. Black Dragon said my father had talked about people floating in bubbles. That's so crazy. What? What? Wow, yeah, that's, wait, wait. My yep, mind. that's like my teachers telling me, Hey, you can't play with them cars your whole life. Yes, you can. Look, I mean, you want to make you want to make a bet? <laughs> yeah, we got a wall full of toys. Over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what oh my I god, can't, I can't do. <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. I have my haunted dolls behind me. I've moved them so that the ladies can join us. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the only the only thing I I collected I collected a blackbird for fifteen years. True. And I and I have. Uh, most of the key instruments out of the cockpit of, and they've all gone Mach 3 plus. Oh, so, so jealous. So jealous. Yeah. And, uh, and you got well, to sit in the cockpit. I have. I'm, I told well, in one of my yeah. conversations, one of my conversations with Ben Rich and this, this goes back into the uh, early nineties. I told him, I said, Ben, I think I, I think I hold a record of some sort. And he said, why is that? I said, I've been in the cockpit of every type of man Blackbird, and there's eight of them. And he said, well, he says, you're only one of about six people in the world can say that. That's amazing. I mean, A-12, the A-12 trainer, the YF-12, the SR-71A, B, C, uh, and Big Tail. Is what I'm missing, but oh, and the M21, the one at the Museum of Flight. So I've been in all eight of them. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. That's and crazy. It's, you know what? Is another cool plane we haven't talked about. What's that? The Harrier. How come they haven't made any other planes that have a vertical takeoff like the Harrier? That's the, X, the, X, the F35B. Oh, does it? Yeah, it's vertical. It's it's uh, it's a sto- It's a short takeoff and la- and vertical landing. So it's stored. Other countries have fighter jets that have that 
it, it looks like the Harrier. Or it works yeah. like what you're talking cool. about. It's a cool yeah. jet, but you don't really hear much about it anymore. It was almost no, like no, it was no. really big when it first came out, and then like you hear nothing. It's it was, it was developed. It was developed by uh, British Aerospace. Mm -hmm. uh, the Spanish has flown the the, the British Harrier. Uh, we licensed to build it in McDonnell Douglas, which is now Boeing down in St. Louis. And there, I think there's still a few Harriers still flyable. Yeah. Now, Paul Allen, actually, uh, former, uh, the late former uh, founder of, of uh, Microsoft, he had four of them. And, and he was going to get one of them flying. The other one's going to be for spare parts and stuff. And the... Uh, there was. It, I'm they, sorry. Did you just say a Harrier was going to be for spare parts? It's sacrilegious. Yeah. No. He, he, one. He, he, they were going to be used for spare parts to keep one flying, oh, since okay, the parts like are that. the parts are no longer available. So, um, and they were. Yeah, they were going to fly it. And he was. He also had an F-105 Thunder Chief hmm. that was privately owned, and he acquired it. Wow. And he was trying to, he was trying to get a J 75, uh, Pratt Whitney J 75. So he could, uh, take it, have one of his pilots take it to air shows and, and. And so saying the VTA yeah. three can do a vertical takeoff and landing. Yeah. That's, 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 that's sort of a quasi helicopter airplane. Um, uh, they're cool. Yeah. Uh, but I can't imagine, uh, you know, they don't. They they don't. Fly, they don't fly as fast as a Harrier. Harrier, I can go about five hundred knots. I think the uh, Osprey is limited by three hundred and fifty yeah. in that neighborhood. It's not. It's 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 an incredible machine. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing about the the F thirty five, the vertical uh, t you know, the takeoff and landing uh, version of the F thirty five. I saw I saw the Iron Bird at Palmdale, the Skunk Works, in nineteen eighty eight. It's still not fully mission capable, and that would break what? that down. Oh, that's thirty-four years. They're still what? working on this. They're still working on the, the final versions of the software. What? Why? Like how? What? 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 It, what? Yeah. Like how did they not? Like I can't even process that bit of information. Like how does it take that long to work on the software? I have no idea. Well, they're probably contracted out to uh, hackers or whatever. You um, think no, they would have it done faster. No, Boeing. <laughs> Boeing yeah, this is true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> need Boeing, to contract it out. Boeing went to the lowest bidder when they did their MCAST. Uh, what I understand, yeah. <laughs> but you, you know how that turned out, right? Actually, I think those airplanes crashed because the pilots didn't know how to fly the airplane. They knew how to take off and land. They didn't know how to get to their destination. So every time the thing would start to pitch up or pitch down. They turn off the autopilot, and then everything would fly good. And then they and they put the autopilot back in, and the thing would, would, would want to go nose down again. I so, had an uncle that worked for Boeing, Jim, and he told me when you fly on a Boeing plane, don't sit by the doors. And I said, "Why not?" And he said, "That's the part I put on." <laughs> oh shit! <geez. laughs> then he showed me the tube of super glue they use. Stop it. <laughs> That's not true, is on. it? I was like, oh no. Oh hell no. A lot of a lot of that airplane. I have had a couple of those tubes of glue. You do not touch that stuff. This oh. is crazy super glue. But wow. yeah, I guess if uh, something's popped out on the plane, you can just glue it down and all, all the windows are out of me. Yeah. <laughs> all the windows are glued in. They're not they're not screwed in, they're glued in. That's so crazy. Is yeah. that why the windows get so cold? Model airplane. Or is it just because no. they're glass? No, there's, there's, there's three layers in there. So yeah. I always sit by the window, but they always get cold. So I'm always freezing, yeah. but I still yeah. want to be What's, by the window. Yeah, <laughs> 60, it's 65 to 70 below zero, you're in, and you're in that far away from it. You know, well, no matter how I good. I have expectations, Jim. What can I say? Yeah. yeah. I did so. see one time, I think it was, I, I've got to have the picture somewhere. I'm going to have to find it and show you, Jim, because you'll probably be able to tell me. But I'm pretty sure I saw, it looks like, I don't know why it would be this close to the plane, though, because we were we were in, I was coming, I think it was when I was leaving Florida. And it looked almost like a, a missile or something going straight up. I could see it out the window. 
of the plane. And I got several pictures of it. It was just going straight up in the air. I don't know what it was. It was too far away that I couldn't see it, but there was like, there was a, uh, were you flying out of Miami? Where were you, where were you flying out? No, I would have been flying out of Tampa. Well, you you may have seen a launch from Cape Canaveral. Oh, what? That would be amazing. I'm going to have to find it and I'll show you. So maybe you can like see what it is, but when I was, when I was at, when I was, uh, Station at Patrick, I saw you know, quite a few launches. The most spectacular ones were the Titan 3Bs or 3Cs. Mm. And they had the two solid rocket boosters. And the biggest one, it was it happened at Vandenberg. It was a uh, it was a Titan 4. Mm. And they have a uh, it's a 120-inch diameter uh, solid, you know, solid rocket booster on each side, mm. sending up a, na- a National Reconnaissance Office uh, spy satellite. And it's about two miles up, and that thing goes boom, and it, it it was the most spectacular non-nuclear explosion you've ever seen. It was just really quite something else. <laughs> well, yeah. At least you can appreciate that. Yeah, um, yeah. A couple billion dollars down the toilet, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, you know, concerning what they're doing today, piece of cake, right? Right. Well, when you put the thing together with glue, what do you expect is going to happen? I yeah. mean, come on. Right. Right. What do you think about the like Artemis one, this like wet launch that is taking, it has been like, did they actually complete the wet launch this time? No, no, because something screwed up. They, they should cancel it or just have Elon take it over. You go it up, it blows up. And two weeks later, we'll launch it. We'll try another one. We know why it blew up. We fixed that. We'll launch another one. Um, That thing has been going on forever. I don't know how many billions of dollars we spent on it. Mm. Crazy. Uh, and it's non-recoverable. Hmm. <laughs> the military and the spook agencies now, when they're when they're going to launch a reconnaissance satellite of some sort, they've told SpaceX, "We don't want a new rocket. We want one of the pre-launched rockets because we know they work." Hmm. <laughs> wow. So scary. and and <laughs> you know, up until Musk came along, uh, I forget it was. It was 15 or $20 million to launch one pound into orbit, one kilo into orbit. Wow. Uh, Elon's brought that down to in the thousands of dollars, not the tens of millions. Of wow. Pound. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Because they doesn't have to buy, he has, doesn't, doesn't have to buy new rockets every time they launch because they, oh, they all come back. <laughs> He's brilliant. The mind yeah. on him is crazy. Yeah. 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 So. Wow. And he took over Twitter. Well, he he's in the process of buying Twitter, so you know we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, yeah. People's people's heads are going to explode, and that's what they're going to happen. Let's hope. I think that would yes. be fun to sit back and watch. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, they already are, right? It's crazy. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. <laughs> Jim so. says, "Well, there it is. The name of my new band, uh-huh. Wet Launch." <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Wow. So you think that could have been something that it would have been close? And I mean, obviously it was pretty far away because I couldn't distinguish distinguish what it was. But you think it would be? I would. It would be visible from an airplane, like a commercial plane. Oh, oh absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're 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 uh, you're above the haze of mm-hmm. population, probably, and there's maybe a bit of cloud free, or even with cloud. Yeah, we were at like cruising set. altitude. Yeah. No, that was it was. It, how 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 soon after you launched did you see it? Uh, oh, I don't remember. It wasn't too long after takeoff. Okay, I know then, we then, had reached then, cruising altitude. Yeah, then it more than like more than likely it uh, it could have been a launch uh, from Cape Canaveral or from Wallops Island, Virginia. They mm-hmm. they launched they launched rockets there too. It's it's. But I see that not, from Florida though. I mean, it could have been like, it was only maybe, we had to have just reached it. So it had to have been like maybe 20 minutes after we launched yeah, or then, uh, took off. Then then, then it's Cape Canaveral. Yeah. And it, it, it was probably a Falcon 9. Mm. That's, that's, you know, he's, he's been, he's been launching stuff almost, uh, I think he, he's shooting for 60 launches this year. Wow. That's crazy. And, and. <laughs> The moon rocket that uh, you know, Boeing and whatever is putting together, yeah, uh, 
you know, they can't they can't even give give it from the vehicle assembly building up to the launch location without running into problems. Oh my God! So, so and you, and you look at it, you look at his engines. Mm -hmm. It it takes I forget how many tens of millions of dollars a uh, main shuttle engine costs, and it takes years to build them. He's pumping out he's pumping out the the Raptor engines like one or two a day. I mean, and they, they went from having tons of uh, you, you can you can see the early version and you can see the current version. The early early version has pumps and hoses all over the all over the place. Mm -hmm. Now it's I mean, there's there's fewer and fewer parts, and they're all reusable. And I what I hope to do if if he if he can come up with a firm date for the super heavy launch, I'm going to drive to Boca Chica. Boca Chica. Uh, mm. beach i want to watch it i've seen a saturn V on the pad i've never seen one launch i was the first night i arrived in edwards in 64 i was walking from the from the uh barracks to the uh, base exchange i'm looking across the main part of the base across rogers dry lake and you can see the twinkly lights at the rocket test stand facility they called it mount ugly and all of a sudden, it's nine o'clock at night in February. All of a sudden, it was like someone turned the lights on. It was a three. It was a three hundred second burn of an F one engine. It was a million and a half pounds of thrust, and you you didn't you didn't hear it for for you know maybe fifteen seconds or twenty seconds, and all of a sudden you could feel the ground the ground just just vibrating. And my dad was there when they launched Apollo 13, and he said he knew it was going to be a disaster because it had been hit by lightning the day before, mm -hmm. and the bureaucrats, not the engineers, the bureaucrats at NASA said, "Oh, it'll be okay. We'll we'll make, we'll, we'll we'll launch it," and they screwed it up that way. So, but they made it back, and because of Apollo 13, I got out of a ticket in on I-5 in Seattle. For doing 115 in my big, big block Camaro as I'm coming off 85th onto I-5, I was I just had it floored. I was just screaming with joy, not knowing right behind me is a Washington State Patrol, and he pulls me over and he said, "Boy, you better have a bit excuse because I clocked you at over 120 miles an hour." He said, "Did Ooh. you hear?" He said, "Did you hear what?" He says the Apollo 13 guys are home. He said. <sighs> That's a good enough excuse. You have a good day. Keep it under Mach one. You know? That's awesome. Me, Keep under Mach one. <laughs> let me let me go. So that's awesome. Oh yeah, my gosh. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, Jim, we have made it to just about the two hour mark. And we always do, even though it I mean the time just goes. I know. We've had we've did. had you know great company here. Yes. Spooky and sunny. Uh just uh uh, I look forward to visiting with uh, Sunny again here. I don't know when it's going to be, but it'll be this year again. Uh, nice. And I would love to come out to I would love to come out to the Boston area. I absolutely yes. love the north. I love the North End. Uh, oh yeah, delicious food. One of my favorite Italian Sicilian restaurants, and it's uh, Villa Villa Francesca. It's on Hanover Street. Okay, I don't know. If and the know. and and this is this. I'm, I'm going back to the 70s and 80s. Last time I was there, it's and, probably still there. <laughs> yeah, and the you know, the owner used to sing with the uh, uh, Naples uh, opera, oh, and wow. he turn he would turn on an Italian opera, just the music, and he'd go around and he would sing. <laughs> Beautiful voice, and the last time I was there, I had colossal shrimp. The shrimp were this big. <laughs> It was colossal shrimp and calamari, yeah, and, and this incredible sauce. And I say only there's only three of them, but it was there was a whole lot of calamari in there as well, and it was just I absolutely loved it. I, I I've eaten in about twenty or thirty of the restaurants there in the North End. So good. And it's so good. Just, yeah, and I'm and I'm a history buff, so I you know, I, uh, and it was another place. And when I was in there, they had a very famous local. A guy come in. Tip O'Neill came in and had dinner. Mm -hmm. he used to have he used to have dinner at Cafe Dinopoli. I think that was the one. He, oh yeah, he, he ate all the ate with that all, all the time. So That's it's just just uh, uh, 
I love I love New England. I don't think I could live there. I am I'm too much of a free thinker. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's fair. It depends on where you are. It's fairly liberal out here, so you yeah. never know. Yeah. You never well, know. I work for I work for a company. I work for a company out, out of Andover for a number of years. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was uh, and I and I had uh, had a lot of clients up. There. I had a lot of clients on the 128 loop mm -hmm. when I was in the. Uh, disk drive business. I sold magnetic heads to disk drive manufacturers. Wow. And I saw the demise coming. My boss said, no, oh, you're full of baloney. This, we just, we just introduced the five and a quarter inch floppy. And I said, well, I was just at, I was just at, uh, it was Comdex. I think it was Comdex 81. I said, I had the three and a half inch diskette. I said, this is the, this is the future. Oh, I won't happen. You know, five years later, you can't find a, you can't find a, a, uh, a laptop or a computer with a floppy disk drive and you know, today you can't even find you can't even find one with an optical disk cd so it's true that is true stuff keeps going nuts so but it has been it has been two wonderful interesting hours i i uh, i'm thank you so much for having us it's really been an honor thank you so much and I, I thoroughly enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy being on with Lynn and, and uh, Sunny and, uh, the, and the Spooky. It's been, it's, been, it's been fun. And, been awesome. Thank you. And next, next week with the garage, the UFO garage guys, oh, I got to give them, I got to give them some crap. I'm going to get, you know, yes. I, well, I, get, I gave Joe all yeah. sorts of crap in Vegas. <laughs> all right, where's my stuff? And then, <laughs> and then Ben decided, well, I'm going to try to kill myself and eat eat something that that's spoiled. He was, in the, oh, God, did he really? He was he was in the emergency room. He, they finally he finally uh, cleaned him out and did whatever yeah. to him and got got him out. His Vegas trip really? was, was ruined. Yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you, Lynn. Joe Joe is the best friend in the whole world. There is not a show when it, when they're talking about how close they are to each other. Yeah. Every two hours, Joe would look at me and my wife, and he would say, "I gotta go check on Ben," and then he would be Aww, gone for like thirty, 30 minutes. So he was gone. <laughs> yeah. And yep. I mean, ben and they're and, 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 nurse up there, and they're from this wonderful little town called Taylor, Texas, and it's yeah. it's 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 a, a a part of America that most of most of most of us never see. And it's just, it's just a nice little, it's a wonderful little town, not, not very big. Uh, and it's not that far from the, uh, the liberal capital of Texas, which is Austin. Yes. And, yes. I have uh, a brother who lives there. Yeah. I saw, I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan there the first time I went to. Oh, nice. Yeah. And it was at city lights, which wasn't very big back then. Yeah. This is back, this is back in the sixties, seventies. So cool. It was the seventies. Oh, yeah. 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 So that's amazing. Well, until next, until next time. Yes. Yeah. I want to, I want to thank everybody that's, you know, that is uh, responded to us uh, and the viewers and, and everybody else out there. If you have any information, if you have any videos, if you have any mm -hmm. stories, you know how to get hold of Lynn, mm -hmm. you know how to get hold of Sonny, but you better share with her first before you share it with him. That's right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm still waiting for that video, it's funny. <laughs> yeah. But keep your keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. And if 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 there if there's something you don't understand, you can't explain, someone on this platform somewhere may have an answer for you. True. And ho hopefully the, the minister of disinformation and truth, or oh, like the Nazis had. Uh, won't put a squash on our on our uh, podcasts and stuff. So, if they do, you it'll all... be my fault, not yours. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. You Absolutely. all take you all take care. I I uh, I have to do something for my voice because it's gone. Yeah, get yeah. some rest, Jim. Some rest. Yeah, we'll do. And, and uh, you take care, Sunny. I hope you're feeling better. You look good. I'm there. Yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah, and uh, say thank your family for for the, their hospitality putting me up here last week. Oh man, they love it when you come, man. I told you you're always welcome. All right, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And Lynn, you do you're doing a great job. And um, thanks. So are I, you? I, 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 I might I may come in during the week sometime when you're when you're on, depending on what I, what 
my honeydew yeah. projects are. Anytime. And, you're always welcome. You know that. All righty. All right, dear. You take care. Thanks. And Spokey, you, uh, you, 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 keep, you keep Sonny out of, uh, out of trouble, okay? <laughs> I'll try. It's not easy. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. yeah. All righty. You guys have I'm a gonna, good night. I'm going to sign out. Adios. All right. Okay. Good night, everyone. Take care. Bye. Good night, guys. Bye-bye.